you move to the beat. You go with the beat. And you no, no, no. I, 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 I understand all of that. It would only be a tool that, in my opinion, that would work for some people, not everyone. I think a lot of people, and I am one of them, would have tremendous difficulty, even at home alone, getting up and moving to music, regardless of the therapeutic, you know, solution offered by it. Others would do really well with it. Tina, my, my ex-wife, that was one of her favorite all-time methods. And um, I'll, I'll share a story because I think it's uh, maybe you'll understand where I'm coming from. Tina used to play, along with a lot of drums and a lot of drumming, she used to play a lot of Irish music in the house. And she played this Irish music really loud. And our house was really large. It had room for loud music in it. I would, I don't remember a time I didn't get up out of my office, walk down the hall, walk down the other hall, go into the living room, turn down the stereo, go back to my own. It annoyed me, that music. It just grated against my bones, that music. Now, I'm Irish English, uh, Scotch Irish English, and uh, Sioux. I'm in perfect quarters. You know, they either came on the boat or they were here first. I mean, that's my family. So, but this Irish music just drove me nuts. Skating on the fiddles and the just nuts. One day, she puts on one more Irish CD. And our timing with each other was excellent on stuff. And she says, OK, come on, it's time. And she takes me by the hand, leads me out around the couch a couple of times, just sort of walking fast, then out the doors, the, the, the doors into the patio, into the courtyard, and starts dancing me around the fountain in the rhythm to this Irish music. Within two minutes, I am in tears. I am weeping and sobbing and dancing and sweating, and we went through the entire CD from beginning to end. And I got in touch with my heritage, but it was very difficult to get me there. She waited three, four years to get me there, where she could use that means for me. And afterwards, when we sat down, she said, now, you see why the Irish drink? It's the music, <laughs> you know? You can't, you can't listen to it and feel it and not drink. <laughs> it's just too powerful. So yes, I think it's a wonderful idea. I love drumming. I, I do a men's thing every two years where all it is is um, uh, himbe drums. It's the entire music for the weekend, which is very powerful, dancing to them, moving to them. I think it would be a good tool for those that think it would be a good tool for them and others that would take them time, unless if you work with this stuff professionally or there are people that will guide them through it or they could get somebody that, uh, they were interested in to go to a dance. You know, there's so many dance things now you can go to, African dance, that something like that. Um, I like the idea of it. I, I certainly like the idea of the physical exhaustion from it. Expressing anger, I, I don't know. I've never, it's only because I have never done it that way. I can see it certainly being done. I've been involved in enough um, dances, Pueblo dances, that I've seen it done. I've seen the anger come out in the dances. Interesting idea. Thank you. That's an interesting idea. I love the Himbe drums. If you ever want something that will knock you over, just get a CD of Himbe drummers. That's that hourglass-shaped African drum. Very powerful. Okay, any more questions or comments or observations before we move on here? Everybody okay? No questions? Okay. Observations? Okay. Okay, now we're going to go over the same 20 questions, but we're going to see if we can maybe have some solutions or tools for all the things we talked about this morning. 
I guess at what normal is. The first thing that's important for me to know here is there's no such thing. It does not exist. It is a concept drawn up by highly controlling people. So that normal is like them. Okay? It doesn't exist. How do you get away from that? The pressure of that, of wanting, wanting to pretend to be somebody than who you are. My experience with this has been it, it's a long process because what I need to do is get comfortable with myself so that I am okay. Once I am okay, I can go anywhere, anywhere in the world and have a good time. I think I was 50 years old before I went to Europe for the first time. And when I got over there, I was over there to spend weeks with my best friend. And I was so glad I hadn't gone before. I wouldn't have enjoyed it. I would have been your typical ugly American tourist. If you didn't understand me the first time, I would have yelled it to you the second time. I mean, I just would not have enjoyed it. I wouldn't have sat on the floor in the Louvre and the Greek and the Egyptian section and wept until my blood sugar dropped so bad they had to take me out and feed me. Uh, you know, I wouldn't have enjoyed any of it, none of it. I wouldn't have had the capacity for it. Stuff takes time. Because I needed to be able to sit on the floor and weep in the loo in order to have the experience, which prior to doing the necessary work up to that point would have not been possible for me. I would have had to look good. Yeah, nice. I like that, too. Nah, I don't know about that. I had to be able to sit in the corner when I was looking at David and just sit on the floor and weep and weep and weep and wonder why pictures, people were taking photographs of something you couldn't possibly take home. Yeah. But I could never have experienced that before doing just the basic stuff of getting in touch with my feelings. As you get in touch with your feelings, and find out you're okay, as is right now, this minute, then you'll begin to get, hopefully, that I don't have to sit in any room anywhere. What I have to do is be me. And even if it threatens my economic security, it is critical that I be me. I was in contract negotiations once a few years back, it meant a lot of money to me. And they kept dragging their feet and this and that, and I knew the people. I mean, I knew them. I finally called them and got the two men in charge on the phone. I was angry, I was in tears. I said, you know, you've screwed me around here. You're betraying me, this isn't working. I don't want to do business this way. I don't want to be involved in this. Now, I had never read in any of the books I read on excellence or corporate behavior that the idea is to call up angry and tearful and deal with the people on the other end. It just never seemed to be a method that was suggested. Worked for me. Brought them around, the contracts were signed two days later and it meant a, a very lucrative three years for me. Very lucrative three years for me. I had to just be real, man. I had to be real. Do you know how hard that can be for some of us? To just be real. What does it take for me to be real? to be in touch with my feelings. My feelings. Life is not an intellectual thought process. It's about being there. At lunch, I, I had a, a, a little brief conversation with a, um, a woman about sweats and sweat lodges. And then she, uh, and then she said, you know, let's get to later, together later. I'd love to get to later and talk about it. And then I thought, I don't want to talk about it at all, ever. I was raised in a way that it's not, that's not it. That's not what it's about. You sweat, you be in the experience. You be there, then, now, and walk away. And you don't ever talk about it again with anybody. That's not, that's yesterday. That's like yesterday's newspaper. 
And as I can get my life more into the now, I mean, <clears throat> there is no way on this in this world, based on your experiences up till this moment, I mean this moment, right here, right now, there is no way, based on your experiences, you could be any different than you are. And this is a very good place to start from. You are exactly as your experiences have made you till this point. So there's no kicking, you know, the hell out of yourself over being who you are today. There's no way with your experiences you could be any different than you are this minute. This is it. It's like, you know, look home, look in the mirror and say, well, oh well. You know, this is it. Are there things now you're uncomfortable with about yourself? Okay, now you can work on them. I can work on stuff once I'm at a starting place. When I can't find my starting place, I can't work on it. But if I just know that there's no way on God's earth I could be any different this moment than I am, no matter how bad I want to be different, then I can relax a little bit and I can begin the process of recovery. This is it, you know? Why do sometimes the people get upset with me in AA when I talk? It's because they think I should be further along for 37 years of sobriety. I got bad news for them. No one in the entire organization is qualified to make that judgment. No one. Absolutely no one. We have so much stuff about outside judgments. No one can make them. <clears throat> How many here in AA or NA are one of those? Raise your hand. I need to show a hand, sir. All right, they got the new thing going around, right? It's Reddit meetings. You may only share about your alcoholism. It comes from general service in New York. Well, I don't know which. I don't know if general service is really intelligent, and that was so smart I can't believe it, or if it's the reverse of that, if they didn't think it true. But the truth of that statement, I can only share about my alcoholism, is this. At any time, in any place in the whole world that I share in an AA meeting, I am the only one in that meeting qualified to make the determination as to whether or not what I'm sharing about relates to my alcoholism. No one in there, I don't care if they got 47 degrees, I don't care if they've run 15 treatment centers, I don't care how the hell smart they think they are, they are not qualified to determine whether or not what I'm talking about relates to my alcoholism. I may be talking about my parrot that just died. And I may be weeping over my parrot that just died. And other than I'm the personality I am, they, somebody would probably jump on me and give me shit for sharing about my dead parrot and, and whining. They would call grieving whining. Most obviously, almost, uh, many, most times, grieving is called whining in many meetings. Well, they don't know what my relationship with my parent was like. Maybe this was my higher power the first five years I was sober. Maybe I prayed with this bird every morning or every night of my life. Maybe I take the bird out in the yard in the morning for my morning meditation and read the 24-hour day book to this bird. No one in the room knows my relationship. You cannot make that determination as to whether or not it has anything to do with my alcoholism. You get this? We're not qualified to make those determinations on others and breathe. They're not qualified to make them on us. Adult children are very quick to give over their power. Very quick. You shouldn't be talking about that. You shouldn't be sharing about that. My experience is 12-step recovery, the most insecure people are the loudest. Yeah. You need some calming voices. You are okay right this second. You can go anywhere in the world you want to go. You know, go sit down with a bunch of senators and have lunch. Fine. It's cool. Just as you are right now. Because there's no way you could be any different right now than you are. So what are you going to do? Not live life because you're not as you think you should be? I have difficulty following projects through from beginning to end. Now this is a killer. This is huge for some of us. A lot of people are ADD. 
Okay? Then you need help. I don't care what kind of help you get. I don't care if you go for herbal treatment. I don't care if you go for this new uh, computer electronic change the brain wave flow. Um, I don't care if you do. I have a good friend who was barely able to return phone calls um, three years ago. It, a bright guy, but just couldn't. He had, and speaking of having projects uncompleted, there was nothing completed in his house. There was projects everywhere. It's a writer. And finally he said, screw it, I can't live like this anymore. And went, saw some psychiatrists, got treatment. They put him on Ritalin. And last year he finished a one year's master program at Harvard. Okay? And we think we're stupid, and we think we're slow, and we think we're dumb, and we think we're this. The tragedy of ADD for recovering addicts and alcoholics is this. If the level of your ADD is severe, you will never be able to read the big book, and you will never be able to write an inventory. People have died for decades in 12-step recovery who are ADD. People have gone away and drank again because they couldn't do it like people were saying they were doing it. Couldn't do it. I think that's why they said, you know, no one among us has been able to maintain anything like. Do you get that? I love that phrase. Anything like, which means we haven't even come close to perfect adherence to these principles. Lighten up. This is who you are. And if you need help, get help. Just make sure you seek a doctor that's high, either in recovery themselves or someone highly, highly knowledgeable about addiction and alcoholism. That is critical. Make sure you get a, doc, uh, a sponsor who has experienced this or is supportive of it. And make sure you get a, a partner who has experienced this in sobriety. And don't do it with any less of a support foundation than that. Okay. There are a couple of books. I'm not crazy, lazy, or you mean I'm not crazy, lazy, or stupid? Is one. The other one is driven to distraction. There's a lot more too. I, there's a new one out which sounds really good. I can't remember the guy's name who wrote it, and I can't remember um, I can't remember the name of the book. But it sounds. You think I guess you go to a bookstore and ask him what the latest book is on attention deficit disorders. Buy a doctor. He is a psychiatrist. He's very reluctant to use Ritalin, Dexedrine, Wellbutrin, and some of the rest of them, but he will use them if they are required. So I, that sounds to me like a highly intelligent book. You know, can we use some of these alternatives? Do they work? If they don't, um, you know, let's go for the... I have six friends sober, all of them sober, two of them sober more than 10 years, and the rest sober more than 20 years who are currently on either Ritalin, Dexedrine, or Wellbutrin. It's not a problem. Yes? I've never even considered the fact that I had that, and I think I probably do now just from hearing what you've been talking about. But just real quick, because I know I'll get those books and stuff, but if I'm at work and all of a sudden somebody's telling me something and I just can't get it. I mean, I don't, I, I get scared and it's like, I think I'm intelligent, but I just didn't hear what they said or I, I can't respond and I kind of freeze up. Could that possibly be ADD? In my case, it would be for me, but I'm not qualified to make that determination for you. But if you have to maybe check into it and... Never hurts to look into anything. You know, I can go look into being a transvestite, although I'm not one, but, you know, what the hell. Go check it out, see what they're doing, what the therapy's like, you know, meet the people, you know, widen my, my, widen my horizons a little, you know. Maybe next time I get bored, I'll find a slick garter belt and some stockings and entertain myself that way instead of having a meeting. I don't know. You know, who the hell knows? <laughs> the other thing is, is there's, make sure that you're... Uh, a lot, there, it can be, it is possible that a recovering addict alcoholic is manic depressive or bipolar. It's not uncommon. Those conditions can um, display themselves, I can't think of the word I want, but it manifests almost as ADD. So it may, you know, so make sure your doctor hopefully has the intelligence to look at the whole picture. That's all.
I am bipolar. I've been diagnosed by three doctors, three, but you know, by UCLA and two other methods of that. That's what I live with. That's what I have to deal with. I just deal with it differently now than I used to. I no longer have seven sexual relationships in one week. I take a medication and I stay home and read a book. You know? Works for me, it's much less expensive. Book's fourteen ninety five, you know. Seven dinners is somewhere close to six hundred bucks. Which I can't afford today anyway. I have difficulty I judge myself without mercy. Well that's it. You are who you are today because you can't be any different. That applies to that too. Lighten up, get off your back. There's no way you could be any different today based on your experiences. Hopefully you can let that just kind of drain into your body. There is no way you could be any different this moment than you are. You want to change? Cool. Start from here. But don't condemn yourself for being who you are. You're the result of your experiences. That's it. It's all we ever are. It's the result of our experiences. Why do you think they said, in, in the, the founders said, share your experience, strength, and hope in AA? Your experience. Because we are the result of our experience. I react to you based off my ex, you know, ex, experience in my history. I was jumping on the hoods of people's cars at four years sober in the middle of intersections trying to explain to them what the little lever on the left side of their steering wheel was for. I was four years sober. I should have been able to behave better than that. But I am the history of my experiences, which is you cut me off. You, took my, you didn't use your turn signal. You took my 10 feet of concrete. You're going to pay. Because my 10 feet of concrete is critical to me. Let's talk about importance for a second. One time, I went to a, a, a universe, a, 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 a real estate lecture. Some guy was a, a, a motiva motivational speaker for real, real estate, and I thought, oh, I just went because the girl wanted me to go. It was gorgeous. I didn't care. Otherwise, he never would have got me to this goddamn thing. And that's God using my character defects against me. God will always get me where He wants me to go by using those things He knows will get me there. And beautiful women or money are two of the quickest ways to get me there. So I'm sitting listening to this guy talk, and he's talking about the levels of spiritual consciousness. I don't remember them all now, but he said, the bottom level of spiritual consciousness is where things are more important than people. This is when you have the dishes that you save only for the certain meals. You know, he says, get the china out and feed, you know, the kids and their friends on it. Because this is basically saying this plate is more important than this person. This is when there's furniture in the house you can't sit on. I mean, you know, the concept is easy. It's clear. When things are more important than people, it is the lowest form of spiritual consciousness. There's another one in there. I'm sorry, I can't remember what it is. The next one is where animals are more important than people. And he said once he experienced this with a friend of his. They went to pick up a third racehorse that their friend had just claimed for $50,000 at Santa Anita. They got the horse and the horse trailer on the back of the car and they're coming back. And he said he looked over, and his friend is gripping the steering wheel so hard his knuckles are white. And he's doing about 30 miles an hour in the right lane on the freeway. And he says to him, what? What? You know, what are you doing? He says, man, you know, that's an expensive horse on the back. He said, yeah, but it's a horse. You mean to tell me you'd be doing 90, weaving out and out of traffic if you didn't have the horse in the car? Just me? You know? It's a horse. Wake up. And then, of course, there's another level in there somewhere, and I don't remember it. I'm going to have to go look all these back up in my notes somewhere. Then the highest level of spirituality is to recognize that we're it. We're God's finest creation. 
in our relationship with our other people is what it's about. It's knowing that you and I are from God. And we're perfect as we are this moment. I wish I could remember what the other two levels were. But uh, so I think so many of us identify with the one with things. I have difficulty with intimate relationships. I think we've really covered that one. I have difficulty having fun. What do you do about having difficulty having fun? Go have fun. I can't. Find someone that can and go with them. Find one of your friends who usually embarrasses you when you are with them and tell them you need to go have fun. You need to go, and they will take you somewhere to have fun. I often need someone to do it with me. I can't do it alone. I can't go alone. I want to go alone. I want to be strong enough to go alone. I want to be man enough to go alone, but I can't often. Often I need somebody to go with me. And I'm lucky to have a couple of friends who don't care what anybody thinks. Go to an amusement park with them, it's like being with a 10-year-old. It's incredible. You know? Take a kid. Borrow your neighbor's kid. Take them to the local water park. Do everything they do. If, you know, take somebody. Just go do it. I had to learn that having fun is okay by having fun. There was no workshop I could go to. Playrooms are okay. Playrooms are good. If you go to a conference and they got a playroom, even if it's for the kids, not the adults, go anyway. You know, go play with the little kids. It's a world of fun, but I had to just go do it. And the more I could do it, the more I could do it. Like now when my squirt comes out or something and says she wants to go ride, the, you know, rides at six five, I'm actually kind of excited about it. She used to come out and I think, oh God, oh God. Oh. And those rides just scare the crap out of me, you know? And now I ride them two or three times. You know, I haven't ridden this newest one at, at Six Flags. Viper was the last one that I used. And I, you know, but I used to ride that three or four times with her. It's like, it's fun. I enjoy it, you know? And people see me getting on, it's like, it's probably the gray hair, like, whoa, you know? I'll be standing there, I mean, 20 teenagers are like, whoa, you know? What is he doing on this ride, you know? He's gonna die, it's all good, you know? He's gonna have a goddamn heart attack and die. They're gonna stop the ride and then, you know, we're screwed. What do they know? I'll still be here after a long time. I take myself very serious. This is this part about lighten up, okay? Lighten up. I one time spent an obscene amount of money to go sit with one of the most powerful channelers in the world. He channeled a character named Dr. Peebles or Peoples or something like that. One other channeler in the world also channeled this same guy. Well, you can believe in that stuff or not, I don't care. I don't even know if I do or not. You know, but that's, I, you got it enlightening up. That's part of the process. Go check it out. Go check it out. You know, what the hell? Have the adventure. Go for the experience. Like she said, go someplace where they're playing drums and dance. Go. If you can't do it alone, take somebody with you that doesn't mind embarrassing you in public. And they will get you on the floor. You see? So I'm spending all this money, I'm listening to all this great stuff, and then I gotta tell you, almost everything that came through from this entity, through this channeler, came true in my life. He predicted a lot of things that I would not, I told you weren't gonna happen, including my giving up Hollywood and moving to Santa Fe. All of them, okay? At one point in it, I said, I need to ask a question here, you know? All right, now get it, this is like, and this is not a guy who does tapes or a guy who does TV shows or a guy who does any of that stuff. It's really like private, you know? It's just, he has no desire to, to do any of that. I said, what is enlightenment? I'm talking to this great entity through this great channel. Paying, I don't know, it was about 750 bucks, I guess. I can't remember. I used to tell people it was 150 because I was embarrassed over how much money I paid. And the answer I got back was, lighten up. 
That's it. Enlightenment. Lighten up. Lighten up. All that money. All that money. And it's lighten up, right? And that's the question I went with. That's all I really cared about. I wanted to know what enlightenment was. I knew I didn't have it. Other people had it. That guy at the meeting had it. You know, the, the soft-spoken, calm, quiet, together man with 30 years of sobriety in the corner. He had it. He had enlightenment. I could tell. He was spiritual. He may have been a pedophile. I don't know. You know? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. But I knew I didn't have it. We'll do that. Lighten up. Make that your motto. Put it on the mirror for the next week. Lighten up. Do you think a lot? Are you heavy, deep thinkers? Do you leave your house, drive to work, and do not remember four inches of the trip? <clears throat> Monday morning, well, if you don't have Monday morning off because of Columbus Day, the next day you drive to work, take a different route, one you have never taken before. We're supposed to be getting out of our mind, into our body, and into our feeling. Take a different route to work. Yes, I can hear you already, okay? Well, I can't go forth. I got to go over 13th, and the goddamn train tracks are there. There'll probably be a train. I know those signals are slow on market. And, you know, I'm going to have to leave 10 minutes early before I'm going to be late. You'll fight this. You will really fight that. What a stupid idea. Drive a different way to work. You know why? Because you can't think. You got to pay attention to where you are because you haven't gone this way before. So, get you out of your, out of your mind and into the surroundings. That's all. It's as simple as taking a different route. Works wonders. Because I'm a real guy who can zone out going the same way. I'll go to the same restaurant or the same thing for three years. Really? I figure once I find it, I like it, I'm not going to take any chances. <laughs> I, I, overre I overreact to changes over which I have no control. Well, this is a this is one you need to be you need to be aware that you are in fact overreacting. I mean, sometimes we are we are having a perfectly healthy reaction to. A, a situation. Understand that definition of mental health is brilliant, the one about trying to do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. If you don't know that one, write it down, baby, because you're going to find it in your life with relationships. Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Picking the same type of woman or the same type of man over and over and over and expecting a different result. Ain't going to happen. And it's men mental illness to do that. <laughs> That's a very widely accepted definition of mental illness. My, I wonder how that would be like for a compulsive obsessive person. <laughs> and working on the sense that overreacting to changes a, be aware that you've overreacted. B, have someone you can talk to about it. You almost need a partner to work through this stuff with. So you can talk back and forth about control. Because oftentimes someone outside of us can see where we're controlling where we can't. Make sure, though, that you do this with somebody who genuinely cares about you. Because love without, um, truth without love is brutality. So you don't need somebody beating you up under the guise of, of truth. You need somebody to just tell you where they think you're controlling you know I always ask my friends like I'll ask someone to help me like Jim I'll say I need some help with this problem let's talk about it or um, you know one of us one of us will say to the other look I'd like to make an observation about you know are you open to it we don't just throw it at them or you know we respect each other and nobody's ever said no yeah please help me yeah please give me advice you know, yeah, tell me what you see. And you know, we don't have to agree. We don't have to agree. You know? 
I told him I thought this one girl he was dating was completely insane, certifiable. He said, yeah, she's cool. She's been drunk for seven months now. You know, I love being right, even if it's the expense of someone else. No, I'm kidding. Please don't take me serious. But I knew, I knew, all my wiring went off. He's usually picked different kind of women than you and I pick. But all my wiring went off and said, wow, you know, adios. This babe's trouble, you know? She looks like a little bird sitting on a limb with her mouth open waiting for the worm and she's gonna make everybody pay for what she didn't get when she was a kid that she thought she could get and it's gonna be the boys. And then the result of her in, uh, in uh, the non-satisfaction, she'll drink. She did. Tell you another one. This one we need to take off the tape, okay? This is the end of tape two. Please go on to tape number three at this time.